Hello, I'm John Allure. Before you listen to this episode, a couple of things. These are podcasts from the first season of Who Killed Teresa? They haven't been heard in over four years. They're raw. It took me a while to develop a style. A lot of people like them that way, unvarnished. Others commented that it was amateurish. Nonetheless, here they are, unedited. I haven't gone back and listened to them. I haven't cleaned them up. Thanks for listening. And once again, life isn't fair. Justice is blind and dysfunctional. And some cops aren't smart and dedicated like on television. This is Who Killed Teresa. Hello, welcome to the podcast. I am your host, John Elor, and this is Who Killed Teresa, a program where life isn't fair, justice is blind and dysfunctional, and some cops aren't smart and dedicated like they are on TV. So to begin, I would like to, we've covered a lot of ground, I'd like to kind of go back and, and recap again for some people who may not um, uh, have been following from the beginning. Teresa Lohr was a 19-year-old Canadian college student who disappeared on Friday, November 3rd, 1978, from Champlain College, Lennoxville, in the eastern townships of Quebec. Five months later, on April 13, 1979, her body was discovered in a small body of water approximately one kilometer from her dormitory residence in Compton. Upon her disappearance, police initially suggested she was a runaway. When her body was discovered, police then suggested that she was the possible victim of a drug overdose, perhaps with the assistance of fellow college students. In the summer of 2002, the family of Teresa Lohr enlisted the support of an investigative reporter and friend, Patricia Pearson, who produced a series of articles for Canada's National Post newspaper that presented compelling evidence that Teresa Lohr was a victim of murder and that her death was possibly linked to two other unsolved local cases, the death of 10-year-old Manon Dubay in March 1978 and the murder of Louise Cameron in 1977. The theory was supported by geographic profiler and then FBI consultant Kim Rosmo, who suggested a serial sexual predator may have been operating in the Quebec region in the late 1970s and advised police to investigate the three deaths as a series. Rosmo had gained notoriety when in 1998, he suggested that Vancouver police create a serial killer task force to investigate the multiple cases of missing women from Vancouver's downtown east side. Robert Picton was eventually arrested and found guilty of six murders, though he was accused of and implicated in an additional 26 murders of Vancouver missing women. The deaths of Teresa Lore, Manon Dubay, and Louise Cameron remain unsolved cold cases. Since that time, since 2002, I have continued uh, this investigation and have geographically identified ad an additional 16 unsolved murders from the Montreal and Eastern Townships region from 1975 to 1981, which may be associated with the original three cases. So one of the things I, I like to do is um, is to read some source documents because uh, I find that they kind of get lost in the mix. So at this point, I would like to read the serial profiler um, Kim Rosmo's report that he prepared for those National Post articles, um, which were released, uh, I believe, August 10th, 11th, and 12th. 2002 in the National Post. So this is uh, Rosmo's final conclusion. Each of these incidents involve multiple locations that, when combined, 
form a persuasive pattern. Cameron disappeared in Sherbrooke, close to where Dubay went missing. She was later found in Magog, near what may have been the location of Teresa Lord's clothes. Dubay, in turn, was found a few miles from where Allure's body outside Compton was found, just off a route linking Compton to Magog. Allure's wallet was found just south of the area where both Cameron and Dubay disappeared. The last link is that of Allure's wallet, which was recovered near the place where Dubay's body was found by Highway 143, which leads back to Lennoxville and Sherbrooke. The locations associated with these three deaths are intertwined, woven together in the landscape south of Sherbrooke. Three murders of low-risk young women in a 19-month period in such a tight geographic cluster is highly suspicious and not likely to be a chance occurrence. These cases should be fed into VICLAS, the Violent Crime Linkage Analysis System used by Canadian law enforcement, and re-examined as a group of potentially linked sex murders. Serial murderers typically live closer to the victim encounter sites than body disposal locations. This offender was most likely based in Lennoxville or South Sherbrooke, during the period of 1977 to 1978. Um, so that's the, the official conclusion of Kim Rosmo regarding the, the Camera, Allure, and um, Dubay cases. And we've, we've spent a lot of time previously talking about those cases. And, and now I'd like to summarize a few things. And um, as a side note, um, I realize the frequency of these podcasts uh, has been <laughs> has been very aggressive, and I should explain that um, that won't last forever. Um, I have been um, snowed in down here in North Carolina, and I use that term loosely. We we got two to three <laughs> two to three inches of snow on Friday, and and then temperatures uh, fell below freezing, and, and have stayed that way for four days, which is unusual for North Carolina. But nevertheless, I, I, I have nowhere to go and, and, and less to do. And trying to avoid my Canadian smugness about, about snow. But nevertheless, um, driving the snow doesn't, doesn't bother me. And, and in fact, it kind of amuses me. Um, and I've certainly had experienced in my life some, some bad incidents. Uh, the worst I ever had since we're clearly on a tangent now. Um, I was driving back from Montreal one time when um, at that time I had been living in Toronto and I had gone in the winter to visit my, my brother in Montreal and I was um, driving uh, along the Trans-Canada Highway, Highway 401 and it started to snow quite bad and, and, and right around Brockville, Ontario, I, I had an incident and, and Anyone who's in the know, and I mentioned Brockville in the winter, you know that that is Black Ice Central. And, and sure enough, I was driving this little tiny Toyota, red Toyota uh, Celica that we had. And I was in the right lane, and then a transport truck moved into the left lane and proceeded to pass me. And as it passed me, the, the, the wind that it created caused my car to do a 360 degree turn on the Trans-Canada Highway and then proceeded to dump me in a snowbank on the highway. I managed to back out and to drive up to the nearest service station. You know, those, they're all generic along, along the Trans-Canada, those combined service station restaurants. Um, and I just sat there for uh, an hour with a cup of coffee shaking <laughs> until I could um, find my composure to proceed to Toronto. So snow doesn't bother me after that incident. Um, uh, it's had a lot of incidents. But <clears throat> dovetailing back, yeah, a lot of content right now. This won't continue. I, I probably will get 
more to a one month frequency, but I figured, well, I had the time, I may as well get as much of this in as possible. <coughs> so going back to, to summarizing some things, what, what do we know? Well, we know for a fact that um, Louise Camara was strangled. She had a boot lace ligature around her neck. We suspect that Teresa Lohr was strangled. Um, although her autopsy was inconclusive, we have a coroner's report that states that marks of strangulation were observed around her neck. And then in the case of Manon Dubé, we, we don't know how she died. And then we also know we have this nexus location um, near Magog, uh, along Chemin Guerre, um, where Cameron's body was found, where the clothing of Teresa Lohr may have been spotted by hunters, and where over the years after conducting uh, two search parties, one in 2006, one in 2016, um, uh, items have been recovered. And those items are a woman's purse, the soles of two women's shoes, a woman's comb, the button off a woman's coat, a woman's shirt, and a necklace. And what to make of all this? So the last thing I'd, I'd like to bring up about it is, is uh, a geographic component. Um, we know that uh, Highway 112 is the way you would get to Chemin Guerre. Um, you would take, if you were coming from Sherbrooke, you would take King Street, which is a main drag in Sherbrooke, and King Street intersects Belvedere. Bel Belvedere is, on the one hand, if you go south on Belvedere, that's where Menon to Bay uh, was last seen. If you go north on Belvedere, you will hit the um, residence of the Sherbrooke Hussars, where, of which um, Louise Cameron was a member and would have frequented that location. So heading um, west on King slash 112, you would pass Bryant Street, the uh, location where Louise Cameron lived. And then further, uh, 112 snakes through Magog, and just past Magog, you hit Chemin de Père. You would turn left on Chemin de Père and then make almost uh, an immediate right onto Chemin Guerre, and you hit the wooded area where Cameron and all these artifacts are found. And what, what should be noted about this is um, uh, there is another, currently there's another access. If, if you want to get out of Sherbrooke and head west, it's Highway 110. Um, and that's, that's the faster highway. Um, if, if you want to get out of Sherbrooke on Highway 10 and make it to Montreal, it'll probably take you an hour and a half. If you take a Highway 112, which was the old highway, it'll probably take you about... Um, two hours. But I think what's important to note here is although Highway 10 existed in 1978-79, uh, it was a toll road. There were five toll booths along, along it, but beginning shortly after uh, Magog, and those booths were manned. You would have had to stop. If you were in your vehicle, you would be seen. Anyone else in your vehicle would have been seen. So if you made the decision to take Highway 10 um, and you were up to something that you didn't want anyone to know about, it was very high risk to, to do that. So the better option would be to take Highway 112. It would take you longer, but you could do it in, in relative seclusion. And the other thing I will mention is, despite the fact that Highway 10 existed, even then, it only started at Magog. And in, all, you know, in order to get on it, you still would have had to take 112, and you would be forced to pass Chemin de Père. Um, and only a little ways after that would you, is the entrance way to Highway 10. So even if you wanted to take it, you are forced to go past Chemin de Père, and it's only, um, it, it, it's only a couple of miles uh, from there that you, you reach this nexus point that I'm talking about, 
where all this um, intriguing activity uh, took place. One, one final thing of note, um, the highway system in, in Quebec is it, it, it's num numerical system. It's much like the federal highway system in the United States for anyone who's following these things. Odd number routes um, tend to run north-south. Even number routes run east-west. So 95 is the main corridor north-south in, in the States. Um, Highway 40 takes you from uh, uh, Wilmington, North Carolina, all the way to Santa Monica, California. Well, it's the same thing in, 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 in Quebec. Highway 10, Highway 20, Highway 40, these lead you um, across the province um, to either Ontario or New Brunswick. A 55 leads you from the United States border all the way into the northern interiors of Quebec. So now I'm going to venture into making my pitch, making my justification for why certain unsolved murders from the eastern townships region should be considered in relation to other unsolved murders uh, from Montreal. And initially, anyone would say, that, that's a stretch, um, John. Um, that's uh, a, an hour and a half to two hour car journey. These, these are different locations, um, different aspects. Uh, what leads you to that conclusion? Well, I'm, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna take some time here because uh, whenever I try to um, explain this, I, I'm, I'm never really given enough time to explain it. Um, although, uh, in some cases, I've had a lot of time. I did uh, Rob Tripp's um, podcast, and he gave me generously a full hour. Uh, CBC Montreal recorded me for um, an hour on this subject, but... Um, unfortunately was only able to broadcast 15 minutes of it. Um, and, and even that is extremely generous for broadcast uh, radio. Um, you know, the, the worst always is, you know, CJAD in, in Montreal, you know, <laughs> they'll call you and they'll, uh, they'll say, can we get an interview? And, and you get on the phone with them and they, they, you know, they'll talk to you for 10 minutes and you think, man, that's great. You know, they're going to put it on live at five or something like this. And he, it usually goes like this. Now oh, we're at the top of the hour and now we have a case of a, a young man still grieving for his sister who thinks there's a connection with a serial killer. Over to John Allure. Uh, yes, I think there's really a lot of evidence that should be looked at. That's John Allure. And now over to live at five, we get a weather update. I mean, it, it's, it's literally that brief whenever you're on... CGAD, <laughs> and uh, you know I appreciate them giving us the time, but it, it it's never enough of of a, of a, <laughs> an in depth interview to to glean anything from it. So so now I'm <clears throat> if you'll indulge me, I'm going to talk um, about two Montreal cases, uh, the death of Lison Blay in June uh, on June fourth, nineteen seventy eight, and the death of Denise Bazinet on October 24th, 1977. And we'll start with uh, Les Amblais. So um, to orient yourselves, uh, Les Amblais dies in the summer of 78 in Montreal, four months after the disappearance of Manon Dubay in Sherbrooke, and five months before the disappearance of Theresa Lor back in the Sherbrooke area. Uh, Blay was found murdered the morning of June 4th, 1978, a few feet from the entrance of her home where she lived with her parents at uh, 4685 Rue uh, Christophe Colomb in Montreal. And it was the back entrance. Um, if, you, if you can imagine sort of townhouses um, in Montreal, you, you know, with those there's an upstairs and a downstairs and those, those winding staircases. And in the back is where you would park your car. There would be back entrances in which 
you'd walk down the alley and then go through like a wooded gate and there'd be a small, a modest backyard and you'd enter from into your house through the backyard. Um, th that's where uh, Blay was attacked. The previous evening, she had been out with friends, first at a discotheque on Saint-Denis, then later at the Philippe Disco Bar on Saint Laurent. She left the bar about 3.25 a.m. Her body was found at 9 a.m. that following morning. She had been struck on the head, there were choke marks on her neck, and she had been raped. Now, police noted that some of her clothing was missing, including Lison's black purse. Writing in an old police on June 18, 1978, Reporter Jacques Durand noted the similarity with other murders at that time, including Catherine Hawks, who also was missing a purse, Louise Cameron, strangled, missing clothing, Jocelyn Houle, Joanne Dorian, uh, Dorian and Houle were both nursing students, and we note that Louise Cameron worked as an assistant at the hospital, Helen Monast, strangled, missing items, and Lise uh, Labadie. And Labadie was one of the Plains of Abraham murders, uh, a series of cases from 76 that took place uh, not in these regions, but in Quebec City. Now, of particular note was Lison's missing black purse. And um, we have noted that um, a black purse was found at the um, dump site of Louise Camera. Um, and in the composite uh, photo that police released of the purse, th the purse looks white. So that's led a lot of people to say, whoa, wait a minute, um, you found a black purse, but the Lison Blay uh, purse was white. That's just the, the nature of the drawing. Um, it, it, if they drew it in black, you wouldn't see anything. It's like a cartoon drawing. But when the article was published, it clearly states that the missing purse was, in fact, black. At this point, I just, I haven't said this yet, but I should. If, if you need photos of any of this, photos of the victims of, of, of the purse, of geographic uh, locations. They're all on my website, and, and my website is very easy to search. Um, at the very top of it is a lexicon of all of these cases in French. You click on the case, it takes you to a page that gives you a full description of, of the case. Just below the, that kind of French summary is, is this exact same summary in English. Again, if you click on any of the cases, it'll take you to the, the, the case. That content is sticky, meaning it will always remain at the top of my, my website. And, and then if you want to see anything new that I, I talk about, for instance, these SoundCloud broadcasts, they're under that. Um, but for me, uh, the most important thing is, are those cases? That's, that's the in information that is of, of, of prime importance, so it's always there. So back, back to the purse. Um, so clearly black, um, the, the purse that was missing, the purse that was recovered um, off Chemin Guerre, clearly the same shape. If you look at the composite, if you, there's a, if you look at the photo of the recovered purse, not exactly the same, but similar. But again, you have a composite drawing being made from memory. And, and then did the, did the Blay family positively identify the the recovered purse is theirs. We, we talked about this a little bit last time. No, they did not. They could not definitively say one way or another, but I don't know how anyone could after so much time, after 36 uh, years, say definitively, yes, that was my sister's purse. If you asked me to identify um, something of my sister from the 70s era, uh, it would be my recollection would be very prone to bias. So, inconclusive. So, the purse is the first thing that we have that connects 
Montreal to the eastern townships and more specifically to this Chemin Guerre dump site. Now we're going to add another component, and that's the murder of Denise Bazinet on October 24th, 1977. And uh, what, what's most important here is that, uh, to begin with, Denise Bazinet and Louise, uh, excuse me, Denise Bazinet and Lise Blais were neighbors. They both lived north of uh, Parc La Fontaine in the east end of Montreal, within blocks of each other. So I'm just going to read to you from a, a little post I made on my website. On Monday morning, October 24th, 1977, a truck driver spotted the naked body of a young woman lying next to the road along Auto Route 35 at the Chambly exit in St. Luc, about a half hour east of Montreal. Police were notified, and at approximately 10 a.m., detectives Jean-Louis Savard and Robert Aubertin of the Sûreté de Québec's Crimes contre les Parcins unit arrived at the scene. The victim had been strangled and there were signs of sexual assault. Clothing was scattered and the victim's wallet was missing. In hopes of identifying the young woman, police issued a press release and published photos showing the victim's face, fingers wearing rings, ear wearing earring, and wrist wearing a watch. The brother of the victim recognized the Timex watch. He immediately traveled to the SQ police headquarters on Parthenay to identify the body. 23-year-old Denise Bazinet lived with her parents on 4252 Rue Brebeuf in Montreal's East End. The Bazinets were a large family. Denise had 10 brothers and sisters. She worked as a cashier at St. Hubert Barbecue. The last time her mother saw her, Denise was going to meet some friends for a drink in a neighborhood bar. She did not come home that Saturday evening, but this was not entirely unusual. As Sunday dragged on with no communication, the Bazinets began to worry and called uh, the police. Denise was apparently last seen late Sunday evening, just hours before her body was discovered, and she was last seen at the corner of Mount Royal and Pepineau less than 10 blocks from her house. Police later released a, a composite photo of the suspect with whom she was last seen. And you can see that composite photo on um, my website. So some things to note about this. Um, again, uh, like other victims, Bazinet is strangled. Um, there have been some accounts that we was, she was a shot but I've, I've seen the, the crime scene photos. She has a very clear ligature mark across her neck. So we have strangulation in the case of um, 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 Camerin, uh, possibly Allure, uh, Lise Blais, and now Denise Bazinet. So four of the victims. We have scattered clothing, which is beginning to become a theme here. We have a missing wallet, which we also have in the case of, of Teresa. Um, and probably most interesting is that Bazinet is a neighbor of Lise en Blais. Um, but Bazinet, unlike uh, uh, Blais, who was found virtually in her backyard, Bazinet is found a half hour west, or excuse me, east of Montreal in the direction of Sherbrooke, Quebec. And, you know, for anyone who thinks I'm cherry picking, um, unsolved crimes, uh, let me just say to you, there were 175, um, 179 murders in Quebec in 1977. I'm talking about 11 of those um, cases. Uh, there were all kinds of murders. Um, I'm, I'm not talking about domestic violence. I'm not talking about gunshot wounds. I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm talking about a very specific subset of, of strangulation um, and in outdoor locations, bodies found exterior, um, often in the woods, often near bodies of water. Um, so it's a very unique subset that I'm, I'm talking about. And 
of note, um, strangulation was not a, a mode of murder that was was very common at this time. It was it was not unique. You'd have a lot of people, strippers, um, stabbed to death or shot. Um, again, as I said, a lot of domestic violence cases. Um, but but something like this, uh, uh, what we sometimes call stranger murders or. Uh, this this was, as I say, a very a very unique subset. So again, if if she's last seen in Montreal and her her body is found a half hour east in Saint Jean sur Richelieu, so how do you get the body out of Montreal? Well, again, you you don't take Highway Ten because you're in risk of those. Uh, manned toll roads and of being seen. So what road do you take? You take Highway 112, the same route that leads out of Sherbrooke um, is the same route that leads out of Montreal. It would take you through Longueuil. It would take you through Chambly. Uh, right around the point of Chambly, you would head south on 35. And then, of course, she's She's found a little south of there um, at the, the Saint-Luc Chambly exit. Um, and keep uh, as a frame of reference those towns, Longueuil, Chambly, in your mind, because they're going to play greater significance as we go forward. All right, on second thought, I've thought about it. Why keep you in suspense? Longay is the location of the, the brutal mur murder of Sharon Pryor in 1975. Chambly is the location of the um, strangulation murder of Helen Monast in September 77. And, and Monast may have been um, strangled by a, a shoelace uh, ligature. Her sister uh, indicated to me that that might well be the case uh, when I spoke with her. But <clears throat> not going to go into a great deal, deal of details on those cases just yet, but just to mention them as a, a frame of reference um, in relation to this, this Nexus Highway, Highway 112, which was the old um, east-west highway across the province of Quebec back in the 70s. Stepping back, I, I want to reference um, from a StatsCan report from 2005, the Canadian Center for Justice Statistics released a report called a Homicide in Canada 2005, and it looked at homicide clearance rates um, from 1976 to 2005. Um, and in that time period, uh, the province of Quebec had the worst clearance rate of any province in Canada. The national average was a clearance rate of 83.9%. Quebec was uh, um, 10 points below that at 73.7%. And then when you looked at the, the clearance rates of uh, individual uh, police forces, uh, Quebec scored is is one of the lowest. Um, the Sûreté de Quebec had a clearance rate of eighty point three. Jurisdictions well above that. Um, City of Winnipeg at ninety four point four. Uh, Ottawa at ninety point uh, ninety two point eight. The OPP, that's the Ontario Provincial police at 91.2, the RCMP at 89.0. So even of those, Sûreté de Québec almost of, um, well beyond, in some cases, 10% um, below at 80.3. Should add that Toronto was below the Sûreté de Québec at 78.4. Uh, but coming in at the very bottom, and I'm saying the very bottom, um, the force of Longay, 74.1 clearance rate, Vancouver at 69.9, .9, 
and then bottoming out um, Laval police force at 67.1 and finally um, Montreal's police force at 65.4 and I'd simply note that uh, the Lison Blay case was a Montreal case um, we haven't touched on it yet, but uh, Jocelyn Houle was a Laval case. Sharon Pryor was a Langay case. And of course, the Sarté de Québec cases would have been Louise Cameron, Theresa Lor, Manon Dubé, and um, uh, Denise Bazinet. Um, because although she um, disappeared in Montreal, the body was found in uh, Saint-Jean-sur-Richelieu. Uh, which was in the SQ's jurisdiction. Also, um, um, Helen Monast, uh, Chambly also would have been in the Sarté de Québec's uh, jurisdiction. So, um, a summary, Helen uh, Monast, ligature, uh, possible shoelace, Denise Bazinet, ligature, uh, Les Amblais, strangled, Theresa Allure, possible strangulation. Louise Cameron, bootlace uh, ligature. This, this led me in, um, I believe it was 2013, to, to make a post on my website called uh, Who Was the Bootlace Killer? It, it's probably the, the post that gets the most hits on my website. It's led some people to believe that police were actually in that era chasing a bootlace killer, and nothing could be um, f um, further from the truth. I, I created that term out of um, whole cloth to <laughs> try to, you know, my apologies, I tried to come up with something, you know, a sexy serial killer name that would draw interest it did, um, but I was by no means suggesting that, that anyone was d diligently pursuing this. Far from it. It was only me. Um, we'll get to my relationships with uh, Quebec law enforcement um, at some other time, perhaps. Um, they are only ever as diligent as I am diligent. If I shake the tree, they'll look at the fruit. Uh, if I don't shake the tree, they go back to sleep, and that has generally been their modus operandi um, in these matters. But uh, nevertheless, less, for point of reference, there's no official bootlace uh, killer. That's that's just me trying to drum up interest and, and, and trying to get some form of engagement in these matters. Um, um, and it's simply trying to to link this subset of nineteen late nineteen seventies murders in Quebec to um, to a mode of execution. So that, that's uh, that's a lot of information for now. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave that with you f for the moment and, and let it uh, gel. Because there's there, 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 there's a lot there. Um, I notice I have a little more time, so I'm going to switch gears now a little bit, and, and I'm going to talk <laughs> about an amusing story. Um, well, it turned out amusing. It wasn't amusing at the time. Uh, about the stupidest thing I ever did uh, in investigating these affairs. So. I guess it was in the summer of 2003, I had made contact with um, an Eastern Township's law enforcement officer who um, I befriended through email but had never really met or talked with. And he became a sympathetic ally and he agreed to smuggle information from Teresa's uh, case file, which at that time I had not seen, um, out of the Sarté de Québec's uh, offices, which were located um, on Don Bosco Street in Sherbrooke 
and to give me portions of that file. I was thrilled of this, of course. So the meeting was to take uh, place at the Auberge de Gouverneur's uh, Hotel, which in, in Sherbrooke is on just off King Street, Highway 112, um, across the street from uh, Don Bosco, where the SQ um, offices were. And we agreed to meet one morning um, in, the, in the main dining hall. And I had driven up from, <laughs> from North Carolina uh, with my eldest daughter, who at that time was approximately four years old. And, and the trip had a bad omen to begin with. I should have known it. Um, I, um, I, I left the home <clears throat> uh, with my then wife saying to me, you, you take care of that girl. And I said, oh, absolutely, of course. What do you, who, do you, who do you think I am? And proceeded up the road. And before I got on the highway, I stopped for gas. I got out of the car to put gas in the car. I shut the door to the van and immediately realized I had locked my four-year-old child with the keys to my car in the van, not 10 miles up the road from my house. I was embarrassed. I was loath to contact my, my then spouse and, and admit I needed help. And if it were not the, for the good graces of a, a, a Mexican day laborer who noticed my plight and came over and immediately had a, a rig for jimmying a lock and did it so swiftly and professionally um, that I could only be grateful. I, I wasn't thinking anything else. He unlocked the door and I, I was reunited with my four-year-old child. So cut to Sherbrooke. We're, we're in the main dining hall. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for my meeting. Um, and I'm dressed, if I recall, rather formally. And my eldest daughter is sitting next to me having um, breakfast. And she has a, you know, it's one of those restaurants. If, if the kid comes in, you get a little picture to draw and they bring you crayons. So she had that. And I'm waiting. <clears throat> and in walks this guy. And from the moment he walks in the room, I, I realize I've played my hand all wrong and I may be in trouble. Because... I've dressed rather formally, and formally by means, you know, I'm wearing like a button down and, you know, <laughs> really ugly ass um, chinos from that area, era. Um, and in walks this guy, he looks like a biker. You know, I, he's, he's, he's wearing jeans, boot cut, cowboy boots, um, leather jacket, He's got that short cropped hair like Mom Boucher. He's got an earring. And, and I immediately realize um, I, I've played the status hand wrong and he's already got a leg up on me. And I don't even, I, I'm beginning to question who he is. He sits down, we talk, he gives me the file. This is great. Um, he then says, um, you know, why don't we get in the car? Um, you can show me where your sister's body was found, because I've never really known. And um, I, I can actually show you where Manon Dubé was found. You know, you show me yours, I'll show you mine. <laughs> um, and I had never seen this location, so I say, yeah, naively, great. So we get out into the parking lot, and, and incidentally, this hotel, this... Uh, Auberge to Gouverneur, uh, de Gouverneurs, is, is the hotel where, like in the 80s, 90s, the uh, Quebec Hells Angels ha held a meeting, and while they were off partying, there was an Ontario provincial police officer who was conducting surveillance of them, and he let down his guard, and, and he left the room for a bit, but unbeknownst to him, the, the Hells Angels knew he was there and they stole his laptop, which contained all kinds of uh, compromising um, information about the rock machine and the Hells Angels. 
So being in this hotel, I, my senses were already heightened to this and to Hell's Angels and, and to the idea of um, that good and bad crossed paths that you never knew, despite you knew who the police were and the Hell's Angels were, there, was a, there were blurred lines. So this was already going, going on in my head. So we get out in the parking lot and I'm like, well, should I follow you? You know, and he's, and he's like, no, no, we'll take my car. And I'm like, well, why can't we take my car? He's like, no, we'll take my car. And so I get in the back of his car with my daughter and I'm like, holy shit, you are in so much trouble. And, and of course, running through my head is, this is some guy who knows I'm in way over his head and and doesn't realize what he's <laughs> he's touching on and my imagination is getting the best of me and you know that that st still may be the case but you know I was I was letting my 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 worst fears run away from me so we get in this car um we drive down to Hatley uh, Ayers Cliff, and he shows me the, the, the location where Dubay was found. And, and then we take there's a, that short road um, just out of the, the Hatley location where you, um, you can cross over to Compton. Um, bear with me, I'm trying to pull it up right now. Um, there it is. It's Highway. Uh, it's Highway 208. Um, is where it is. You just kind of go north from where uh, Dubay was found. You cross over 208, and you're in you're in Compton. Drive up to uh, Chemin de la Station. I drive down that. I show him where Teresa was was found. And all the time, I think you know he's gonna he's gonna pull off on a side road. Um, me and my daughter are going to be left with a, a bullet hole in our head um, in a gravel pit somewhere. Uh, thankfully, this was not the case. Um, he turned out to be true to his word and, and has since been a, a real ally and um, a great friend to me. But that is the stupidest thing I have ever done um, investigating these matters. One other uh, um, idea I'll leave you with, you know, in, in doing this work every time, um, you know, I dig things up, but it's never as if I am completely confident in what I'm doing. And how, and how could I? Because law enforcement holds the, the key to all this information. So every time, even from the original uh, release of the Who Killed Teresa stories in the National Post to more recent work, um, I, I'm, I'm always uh, in the position of being a little fearful that I might be embarrassed that the police will say, you got it all wrong. Uh, didn't you know that case was solved years ago? You know, that, that, that's your worst fear is that you're going to end up looking like a supreme idiot in these things. And, you know, it, it, with, with the Cameron case it, it, and, and the um, um, Dubai case, that, that never happened. Um, the, the police at one point tried to embarrass me uh, in the aspect that they, they, <laughs> they, they, they came to me uh, one time uh, on a phone call and said, uh, uh, Mr. Alar, um, we understand that uh, Patricia Pearson, the uh, investigator, that uh, she once was your girlfriend. It's like, yeah, that seems to be a compromise. There's, it's like, um, it's not a, it's not a compromise, buddy. It's a well-known fact. Uh, <laughs> not an issue here. Well, you, you know. Uh, Seems to me that you are, you know, they tried to make a big deal out of it when there was really not a big deal out of it. Um, that was <laughs> look, looking into my uh, personal affairs with my first high school crush was really the uh, extent of their investigative work. 
a little funny now that I think of it. Um, but, but in other matters, you know, every time I bring this up, adding cases, I'm, I'm always fearful um, that I got something drastically wrong. And so far, I, I don't. Um, and I've met a lot of these, these family members. You know, of course, I've met uh, Chantel Dubay. Um, and then, you know, adding the other cases. I, I know the sister of uh, Lise Amblay, um, Solange. I've met the brother of uh, Denis Bazinet. I, of course, know the Priors and uh, and know very well uh, Nicole Monast, the sister of Helen, Helen Monast. You know, most by now, most of us are, are, are Facebook friends. Um, you know, by friends, I don't mean friends. It's hard to be friends with people like this when you share something that's so horrific. But we stay in contact when we need to. And But each time I, I, I meet with one of them, I'm always fearful that, you know, one of them is going to go, you know, my worst fear would be, what the hell are you doing? Why are you um, dredging this up again? Uh, what is your beef with Quebec law enforcement? We've enjoyed a level of service that has been extraordinary. But that's never been the case, ever. Um, what is been consistent is a sense of, I never knew someone else felt this way. I felt isolated. I felt alienated by law enforcement. I never felt I got the answers our, our family deserved. I'm grateful that someone else is doing this. Um, so I, I don't feel like I, I'm doing it alone. I'm re-engaged to do it because someone else is doing it. And all of those things are, are very, very um, gratifying and confirming. Um, you know, it's just a family. I mean, certainly if you're an unsolved uh, homicide, th that is uh, reaching into the decades, um, it would not be unlikely that you're experiencing frustration. Um, with um, agencies of authority. However, the, the level of frustration in Quebec and how uniform that frustration is across agencies, from Longueuil Police to Sarté de Quebec to uh, Municipal Police of Montreal um, to Longueuil, uh, to uh, Laval Police, um, is disturbing um, and, and I think there's a lot to be probed there it's it's one of the reasons that we've called for um, a public inquiry into these matters with specific reference to the matter of evidence destruction um, we've pressed on the Minister of Public Security uh, Martin Quatier he initially um, refused us, but um, we're patient, and uh, we will choose the time and the place um, when uh, we decide to move forward as a vanguard um, to press these matters further. So I think uh, that's it for for this time. In in closing, I I will say again, um, you can always contact me um, through email. I have a email set up. It's Teresa Lore at gmail dot com. T h e r e s a a l l o r e at gmail dot com. If you write me there, um, I will entertain your questions, your suggestions, if there's anyone you'd like me to talk to in future episodes, <clears throat> happy to do it. As I've said before, um, initially I kind of want to set the groundwork by just me talking. No theme music, no, uh, none of that stuff. It's just bare bones, people. Not a gorilla podcast. 
don't need a lot of that. Um, I know the facts. I've known them for years. Um, but I will eventually open it up to a, a dialogue with certain people of interest in these matters. I think, uh, I think that'll be a lot of fun, and I think you'll enjoy it. So thank you so much for joining me um, on these wintry days, and have a great one. Thanks.